So welcome to Professor Scott Olson. Welcome to uh, Leeds Theosophical Society for the latest of our Sunday afternoon uh, Zoom talks. Um, now, many people will know you, Scott, because of the, a wonderful little book you did on sacred geometry and the golden section. I think it might be useful if we could just kick off by you explaining the very rudimentary things about why the golden section uh, is so important and why sacred geometry is so important. You were asking about the golden section. Did I kind of catch that at the end? Yes, that's correct. If you could just explain, you know, the basics of this for people who probably don't sure, know sure. about it, yeah? Sure. Um, the simplest way to, to talk about the golden section is probably to refer back to Plato. In Plato in the uh, Timaeus, actually the Republic, he says, take a line, cut it unevenly. And then he says, take those two portions and cut them again in the same ratio. The simple way to think about this, and I'm going to hold up, this is an old timer. So let's just say you have magnitude and you're going to cut it. You don't cut it in the middle, but if you cut it in the middle, the ratio of the whole to one of the segments would be two to one. And then the segments to each other would be one to one. But when you cut it at what's called the golden cut, you get a ratio of the whole, the longer segment is in the same ratio as the longer segment to the shorter segment. There's only one way to do that. That's the golden cut. That's how nature works. Everything begins in this very simple golden cut that the ancient Egyptians called the primordial scission. Another place you're going to see it very well worked out, quite not very easy, is Schwaller de Lubitsch's Temple of Man. So um, this, it's, they call it the primordial scission, where the one divides and then it fractalizes. It keeps doing this ratio over and over and over again so that the entire universe, the galaxies, solar system, human being, everything has this relationship. That's why we see Fibonacci numbers everywhere because any two adjacent Fibonacci numbers, so Fibonacci numbers, let me just say a little bit, you begin with zero and one and you add those together and you get another one, zero plus one is one, one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, you see them in the head of a sunflower, you see them everywhere. Um, any two adjacent Fibonacci numbers approximates this golden ratio. It's nature's way of taking uh, the golden cut, this divine ratio, and expressing it. So let me try to show you maybe a, a simple example. So this is a golden calipers. It's not in the best shape, but it's divided at the golden cut such that I can take and I can measure the phalanges of my fingers and you'll see just in a moment. Uh, so first of all, no matter how wide or how narrow this is opened, the longer opening here, the distance up in the top here, to the distance down below, it's in the golden ratio. So for example, if I take my finger, and it's, it's the uh, bone, it's not the uh, flesh, so it looks a little, it's a little tricky to do. So if I measure the tip of the finger, the, the distal phalange, and go to the medial phalange, you'll see that it measures that. So then I take it and I, I open it up again to the narrow part, put it here like this, flip it over, and it'll go to the, it's a little bit, distal, I mean, proximal phalange, which is, my fingers are kind of bent here, it's the sum of the previous two. So okay. what happens, so nature adds these things together. It's it's kind of like a rhythm, a, 
a, a pulse that runs through everything. So yes, can I, Kim. Scott, um, is this idea of the golden section, does that lie at the heart of what we call sacred geometry? Is it part, is it a fundamental part of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the interesting thing about sacred geometry is I actually developed a drawing uh, um, called the Golden Chalice of Orion that shows when you have the golden pot, the ratios that are created by it, there's two ratios. You actually have a greater version and a lesser version. It's a little tricky I, uh, to kind of grasp this right at the outset, but it's um, the greater is, let me just give you a number, but it's irrational, 1.6180339, roughly 1.618. That's called the greater version. The lesser is exactly the same number minus one. So it's 0 0.6180339, or roughly 0 0.618. The one is the greater, the other is the lesser. Big one is the greater, then the other is the lesser, and then unity or one stands in between the two in relationship to them. So in my drawing, I was able to show how the other root ratios that are used in sacred geometry, for example, square root of two, square root of three, root five, etc., they all flow out of, you can create them out of the golden ratio. So it seems to be like the primordial modular that gives rise to everything else. And do we see this in the architecture, the great architecture of the past in Babylon and Egypt and in Greece? Do we see this featured in their architecture? Absolutely. And uh, we have to be a little bit careful because sometimes people will say that something is golden ratio. It may be square root of five, which is uh, actually is used in, if you uh, use numbers to calculate it, the golden ratio, you'll have root five. For the Parthenon, for example, uh, people will talk about it having a golden rectangle. So the, the uh, um, actually, I can point up behind me here, you see the cover of my book, or maybe I can, I'll show you the one that's been in the rainforest a bit. So you have this kind of like golden rectangle there. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I had about two hours of sleep. Your question again, let me go back to it. Well, yeah. It was basically just how uh, various aspects of the architecture yes. in the classical architecture of the past. And indeed, perhaps more interestingly, why it probably doesn't feature at all in any contemporary architecture, does it? Well, it does. Like People like Le Corbusier. In fact, there's quite a bit of architecture that does. That's where Keith Critchlow uh, comes in, uh, the, kind of the disciple of Bucky Fuller, who was really one of my main teachers uh, from England, or Keith Critchlow, uh, would design things using the golden ratio. Uh, the Great Pyramid at Giza is a monument to the golden ratio. The actual structure itself, the... Um, uh, there again, that's why I was kind of hoping we'd have a couple images. I could, it's a little easier to show with images. But um, uh, Badawi, for example, uh, the scholar discovered in the temples all over Egypt, golden ratios and Fibonacci numbers everywhere. In, the Greek, in, the, uh, in Greece, it is the, the kind of the key that's coming out of Plato and you see it in the canon of Polycletus. Polycletus would put it into his, his sculptures, and his sculptures were so incredible, they looked like they were living beings. So it really is uh, everywhere. Uh, you see it in Gothic architecture. In fact, you see it in Romanesque. Uh, it's actually throughout the history, and then we see it reoccurring now, uh, in the 20th, 21st century, the Corbusier would be a, a key one with his modular man. A good example. The first, the first time I met you at Bolton Theosophical Society some years ago, you, you pointed out a couple of modern things um, uh, where this uh, 1.618 featured, you said an A4 sheet of paper and a credit card. 
those um, are done in that particular section, aren't they? Yeah, a credit card is is usually about a, a five by eight. So there are many, many things that, that will tend to uh, fit into the golden ratio. So here you get kind of an example of certain things. You see the credit card up in the uh, upper corner there. Um, so it's it's not unusual uh, to find them because what happens is because it's nature's way of uh, it's it's beauty that draws it attracts us in and so unfortunately many people in advertising are using it and i say unfortunately only because they kind of misuse it and they will use it with things that probably it should not be used with but yes uh, computer screens uh uh but you also get the other ratios with it like uh, square root of three and square root of two, they're also very common. Your A4, I think we're talking uh, the the papers, uh, isn't that root, uh, it's root two or root three. Uh, that That's why this is like a modular form, the way you build up your paper in England. It's much better than the way we do it here in the U.S. Okay, well, this seems an opportune moment to turn this off into a bit of a tangent and to actually go on to the topic that this uh, talk or uh, conversation was going to be about. We've seen how important the golden section is in all sorts of things in the natural world, in the way we design things and, and many other things in the universe. What many people will not be aware of is that the golden section or divine proportion was actually crucial and central to the formation of the Theosophical Society back in the autumn of 1875 in New York. And this is a fascinating story in itself, and this was what Scott was originally going to talk about. So let me hand it over to you, and you can kind of take up the reins of how this divine ratio or divine proportion was fundamental to the formation of this society. Well, on September 7th, 1875, George Henry Felt, who's an engineer, architect, and inventor, gave a talk in Madame Blavatsky's apartment in New York to 17 people. And the title of the talk was The Lost Canon of Proportion of the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. And according to Felt, this unlocked the geometrical canon that was used um, in it well, unlocked the mysteries of art and nature and had been adopted by Greek architects to build their temples and forums and then lost. Colonel Alcott was so impressed with the talk that he passed a note to uh, Judge to hand to Madame Blavatsky, and the note was, we need to start a society where we can uh, talk about these particular um, should we say, uh, subject. And let's see, I'm having a little difficulty here. Okay. Um, so what, in fact, what Alcott said, I can tell you, he proposed to form the Society for the Investigation of Science and Religion. It was to be entirely eclectic, the friend of true religion and the enemy of, of scientific materialism. It would be a nucleus around which might gather those willing to work together to organize a society of occultists. And it was unanimously agreed that it would be formed uh, for the study of the elucidation of occultism, the Kabbalah, uh, etc. And at the September 13th meeting, Felt further described his discoveries, and it was agreed on that, it was only six days after the initial talk, they agreed that it would be called the Theosophical Society, and it would be... Uh, the objects would include the Society of... Uh, would be collecting and diffusing a knowledge of the laws which govern the universe. It, it seems very interesting to me, Scott, that, that 
something which is so fundamental to the universe, these mathematics, this sacred geometry, all this stuff, also helped to build the roots of, you know, one of the most important metaphysical societies of the last century and a half. And it just seems, you know, it is one of those kind of divine correspondences as above, so below in, in many ways. Can we, can we move so, on? So let, let, me, let me continue, though. So what happened was hmm. felt was to give further lectures. But the other thing was, was, was not only the geometric proportions that the ancients knew, but he had also discovered the mantras that presumably could in, in evoke the elementals. This got um, uh, Alcott really excited because remember in 1875, he initially had this had tried to, to form a uh, miracle club. And, um, and he got a little bit upset because both Blavatsky and uh, Felt would not perform phenomena in front of the uh, members of the society. And so because he be became upset about this, the new president he became much more fascinated with his claim to be able to invoke the elementals than this rediscovering the knowledge of the laws which govern the universe. So th it was kind of forgotten, actually. Uh, Felt also became one of the first vice presidents. So he had quite, quite a role, but Alcott became very, very uh, narrow in, in what he really wanted to do after Felt would not uh, present these things. And actually, um, Lobotsky later in her scrapbook indicates that Felt had actually shown the evocation of the elementals before a group of nine people. That's in uh, the collected volume one, pages 192 to 193. And so um, what Alcott did, and, and this is in Alcott's own words, this is, this is, Tim, this is how it got distorted. Alcott states, I did what I could in the way of getting psychometers, clairvoyants, mesmerizers, and spiritual mediums to show us sundry phases of psychical research or psychical science. Uh, however, he was aware of the suspect, quote, and this is Alcott writing this now, character, quote, character among our members of the first year. A majority came to gape and be astonished, to get psychical powers for selfish ends without personal effort. A minority are prompted by a yearning after knowledge. So what happened is it totally got lost in the mix-up here, the, the, the whole notion of the golden section, and now it's kind of being rediscovered. We're bringing it back out, and we're finding it everywhere in the sciences now as well. Okay, let's uh, move on to some of your other work. Uh, we mentioned earlier on um, your work with well-known people, people from science, philosophers and others. Um, I'm particularly interested, as I said, uh, about Edgar Mitchell and the wonderful work that, that he did. Who has been your greatest inspiration, or would you care not to identify it? Well, no, no, I'm happy to, happy to. No, there have been uh, several who have been very important. Right there from your country, uh, both David Bohm and Douglas Baker, Dr. Douglas Baker, um, both of them had tremendous influence on me. I studied with Bohm for, uh, while I was at the Birkbeck College, University of London for two years, and John Hasted, so there are going to be several people I'll mention here, Hasted, who was the uh, head of the physics department there, and Bohm was in it, uh, they invited me to work on proposals for scientific research that they were doing with paranormal or psi phenomena. Uh, and so working with Baker, the occultist, esotericist, on the one hand, working with Bohm there uh, in the physics department and doing my philosophy with Plato and Aristotle, etc. And Bohm actually read my uh, master's thesis on the collapse of continuous space-time. Uh, 
<laughs> Another really important individual was Houston Smith. He became a very close friend. I went. I was selected uh, as one of twelve individuals to do a um, National Endowment of the Humanities uh, uh, special uh, session, eight week session with him out at Berkeley. There was just a dozen of us, and I, I worked on my golden section and divine proportion during that course. And then he and I became very, very close. And he actually wrote the, uh, before he passed, he wrote the uh, uh, forward to, to my next book, the, <laughs> the Divine Proportion, The Mathematical Perfection of the Universe. Uh, Edgar Mitchell was very important. Now, what's interesting about Edgar Mitchell, he and I would present together. Mitchell was, uh, and he loved the golden section because he, he was really well familiar with it. But a couple things with Mitchell, he was known as the brain at NASA. He was the smartest of all the astronauts. Um, and when he was uh, on, on the way uh, back from the moon, when he could relax, he was the pilot taking the lunar module in. But when he was able to relax, he was able to do uh, statistically su successful experiments with psi phenomena, uh, whether it was telepathy or clairvoyance, it could have been one or the other, but it uh, it was statistically significant. But then he went into samadhi, and that was the big thing. Having gone into samadhi, cosmic consciousness, he began to realize that the universe is not only alive, but it's intelligent. And so he formed the IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences for Scientists, much like your medical and scientific network that you have there. So he and I became very close friends. In fact, I helped him with uh, working on one of his inventions, uh, uh, basically using the hemispheres of the brain to engage the left hemisphere to watch maybe a television, and then the right hemisphere uh, is taking in information. You're learning calculus while you're watching uh, um, uh, Archie Bunker or whatever. Uh, and... Um, but his most interesting, what he was most interested in, Tim, was what's called abduction, which is uh, um, not not abducting like extraterrestrials, but retroduction or novel reasoning, which is what Plato would use when they could not tell you explicitly what their beliefs or thoughts were because they would have been punished. In fact, it was considered... Uh, and penalty of death to reveal the secret of the golden section. I'm convinced it was revealed in the Eleusinian and Egyptian mysteries, because as Blavatsky says, uh, the secrets of proportion are revealed in the initiations, and that's probably what was revealed. So Plato, jumping over to another area just for a second, in the Timaeus could not describe the, the construction of the dodecahedron, because to do that, you have pentagons, which are made up of golden ratios, and that's forbidden. Pythagoras did reveal it. The Pythagorean, they put him in a boat out to sea, and they, in other words, he uh, died. Um, so Edgar Mitchell was extremely important. Another one is uh, Alexei Stakov, who had over 60 uh, Computer Fibonacci computer patents using the golden ratio um, in the old Soviet Union. Really peaceful, lovely man who then moved to Canada. He, in turn, uh, invited me to Odessa for the International Congress on the Harmony of Mathematics, which is all about the golden ratio. And uh, he said, you must meet Muhammad el-Nashi, the Egyptian, but also um, uh, Englishman. And um, so I sent him a copy of my book. We became fast friends. And then so more recently, El-Nashi um, and a individual from China and from uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, I'm sorry, uh, we did the book, A Grand Unification of the Sciences, Arts, and Consciousness rediscovering the Pythagorean Plato's golden mean number system. So El Nashi was extremely important. There have been many um, uh, in the areas of near-death experiences, so many different places, so many different people. Um, 
let's see, John Michel, extremely important. John Michel, when I'd go to England, I'd either stay with Douglas Baker or John Michel. John Michel and Keith Critchlow had worked together with Kairos, Kairos School of Sacred Geometry. And Michel was so impressed with my little golden section book that he did a painting and a little poem for me. Um, and it's a short poem. And, and all, so you can see how close I was with these individuals. He says, new light on phi. Phi is another name for the golden ratio. A book I greatly value, it's the pride of my collection, is Mr. Olson's recent work upon the golden section. It's something that could change the world if they could understand it. And then the way he's written it, you, uh, I don't know if you can see this, you have to kind of back up. And if they could understand it, I'm certain the authorities would long ago have banned it. The secret it exposes is the key to life's creation. I can't explain it in a line, so here's an illustration. So he would do these watercolors, and he did an a illustration of it. Um, let me mention, just give me one second here. Um, so in the areas of science, Sir Harold Proto, who discovered the structure of carbon-60 as being a buckyball. Buckyball, if you take an edge of a buckyball, Buckminster Fullerene, or it's a truncated icosahedron. It's an icosahedron where you cut the corners off. If the edge is one, you go across to the other side. It's not a golden ratio. It's exactly three golden ratios across to the other side. So again, it's nature is resonating with these structures. And um, uh, so he became a very, very uh, good friend. Um, many people in the areas of uh, near-death experiences, uh, others that have been very important, free off Capra, Lucian Hardy is an important one that most of you will not have heard of. Lucian Hardy, back in 1996, discovered that entanglement in physics, when two particles are entangled, they can be on opposite ends of the universe. If you know the properties of one, or you change it, you know the other one on the other end of the universe exactly what it is. Um, and... Um, he discovered that entanglement occurs at the golden ratio, the lesser golden ratio, to the fifth power. So this is just absolutely incredible because entanglement is what leads to non-locality. And so really what we're looking for is where things are non-local, they're occurring at the golden ratio. That is the key. So whether you're talking all ancient Egyptology, whether you're talking uh, modern physics with Muhammad El-Nashi and what's called the E-Infinity theory, it's all golden ratios resonating there. Okay. Well, uh, it's uh, very interesting to see how this stuff is probably more pervasive than most people realize. Let's move on, Scott, from the people who've influenced you to perhaps some of the places that you've visited. Because... You have a great interest, and I understand quite a large collection of shamanic art and ethnographic stuff. And I know you've had a lot of experience, particularly in South America. Is that one of the most important places for you, South America? Yeah. Mexico, Mexico and Brazil to, well, Mexico is more central, but uh, Brazil to a degree, but primarily Peru. And so, Back in 2017, I did a big exhibit at the Appleton Museum here in Ocala, Florida, uh, Mysteries of the Amazon, uh, visionary artwork of Pablo Juan Maringo and his students. And what I did or have done over the years, I'd go into Peru, into the rainforest to work with the shamans. Um, it's been one of my paths. Uh, it's not for everybody. And I do not I honestly, I, I will share these experiences and things that have happened to me. 
I don't recommend it for everyone because it, it's a difficult path. People think uh, it's maybe an easy path to go do ayahuasca. Uh, yeah, it can open things up, but it can bring everything to the surface. And if you do it right, it's extremely painful. There's, uh, I learned this in bodybuilding, no pain, no gain. And so when I would go into Peru, that became a focus of mine. And every year that I went down there, probably what, eight, nine, nine years, uh, this year will be the 10th that I've, I've gone down. I collect the artwork from the artist. Originally, I would get the artwork of the famous artist Pop and Ayahuasquero, Pablo Amaringo. But many of the paintings, just to give you an idea, so you, you can see, and they're, they're visionary artwork, beautiful artwork with animals and plants galore. Uh, <clears throat> and so, yes. Um, and these are, based that's on, been, are these based on his experiences having taken ayahuasca? Yes, but first to master the artistry of the of nature itself. So what he did is he trained these young people, just children, gave them uh, paintbrushes um, and canvases, etc. And in the rainforest, they would learn to draw nature, beautiful artwork. And, and I've collected much of the artwork as when they were children. No ayahuasca. It's beautiful artwork. And later on, they would use this kind of transformation of consciousness, opening up, seeing more deeply into nature, the life, uh, the subtle energies, subtle life that's present there. And so many of the paintings, uh, as you can see, like on the cover here, you see uh, the jaguar. This is a Shipibo woman. Uh, you'll see plants, uh, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what would happen. And uh, over the years, I've collected that and have a huge, huge collection of, of shamanic artwork. Could you tell us a little bit about your involvement with and your work with the uh, shamans themselves? Because this is an area which fascinates a lot of people. And I'm sure there are possibly great misunderstandings about who these people are, what their role is, what their function is how they operate. You will have had some direct insights into this sort of thing. So I think it would be um, very valuable and very interesting to hear about your personal involvement with them. Well, the shamans, are we call them kiraneros. With the root of that word, kir, is the key word. They're healers. Or if they're female, kiraneras. Kiranderos and Kiranderas. And the shamans I learned with from primarily were mestizo, so they're native, uh, indigenous, mixed with the Spanish, and Shipibo, actual Shipibo shamans, which is a tribe, Shipibo Penibo, sometimes mixed together. And what they do, uh, they've trained with the various plant teachers over the years. There are some animal teachers as well, um, and there's a couple that are actually psychotropic or entheogenic. Um, entheogen, let me just explain that word. Entheogen, N within, Theo, the divine, Gen, Genesis, becoming. Essentially what's happening is you're drawing the spirit, the divine within you, out, and then seeing it in the open. And this includes all of the subtle energies that we as theosophists and students of the ageless or ancient wisdom are really familiar with. Uh, and it's it's pretty shocking. Uh, person who, you, and if someone goes to do it, you must be prepared. There's an important dieta that you must go through. Uh, there are certain things you must not be doing, like antidepressants, etc., and you must be off them for a period of time. Uh, no salt, no uh, uh, greasy foods, there, uh, no spice. Uh, so very bland diet initially to allow the spirits of these plants to really enter in and infuse your body, uh, etc. 
you, um, the shaman will meet with you and typically will ask you questions like an interview, but also watch you look at your auric field and will, uh, after the interview, will have certain plant features that you're going to take during your 10 days in the rainforest. That's typically what I would do. I'd go in for 10 days with a group of about a, a dozen to up to maybe 20 people max. And every day, the um, attendants would bring a pitcher, uh, water mixed with the plants. And these plants could be uh, anti-tumor, rejuvenation, uh, memory, various things that you need work with or help with and usually not psychotropic so that's the healing part then um, five during those 10 days five sessions of ayahuasca four of them in the nighttime and usually they're done at night in a big maloca where everybody sits in a circle during the day you're isolated in a tambo um, reflecting on your experiences journaling uh, not talking with a bunch of people, uh, no TVs, nothing distracting you. You're going inward into a deep, deep meditation and understanding the experiences that you've had. Uh, they do one day that's during the daylight, which is a very, very interesting experience to be present with all of nature there. One of the beautiful things during these sessions is you sit quietly for a period of time and then suddenly rises up within you and you say oh my god i had no idea and it's it's so overwhelming it is not it's not like somebody getting high on something nobody would ever use ayahuasca to get high to the contrary it's like the eleusinian mysteries ayahuasca is the equivalent of what the ancient egyptians were using uh, but also uh, at Eleusis, they had the kukion, some people pronounce it the kukion, which was the barley drink. But I've also examined all of the uh, the landscape there and the plants that are present at Eleusis, uh, which is just outside Athens, where every year the candidates would go and have this tremendous experience. And the blind would even see. They would see clearly. In fact, there's a Stella there at, at Eleusis uh, of the blind individual uh, um, commemorating his ability to see during the experience. Doesn't mean they see later, but they see at the time. Um, and so uh, in these transformative experiences that, that last maybe up to about five hours, it can be very similar, I'm sure, to Eleusis, which is a descent into the underworld. You really, it's a dry run at death. One of the uh, famous quotes of the Eleusinian Mysteries was, and, and so I'm, I'm comparing Ele Eleusis to um, Peru and the rainforest with ayahuasca. If you die before you die, you won't have to die when you die. If you die before you die, you will not have to die when you die. It's a dry run at death. That's exactly what these experiences are. You are uh, moving into the realms of, of death. I've descended into hellacious places, but it's, I must tell you, it's very interesting. The divine is present in the darkest places you can imagine. Uh, usually in these experiences, people will have to face their ego, all the nasty crap, the personality we get caught up with. But that's the beauty of these experiences, because you don't wait until you die when you can't do much about it. You just, you know, you, you know, with these near-death experiences, have the life reviews that uh, in a second, you can have your whole life, every thought, word, everything is present, because there's no time. Time is here. You, you're out of time during these experiences, and they're so profound. And then you, but facing your ego is the key. And then being reborn, you die to the ego to go through a rebirth process. That's essentially what these experiences are. Um, but again, not, not for everybody.
Can I ask you, Scott, do you think that these experiences with these various hallucinogenic and, and psychotropic uh, substances, are we talking here about people um, accessing the astral realms or the etheric realms, the lower parts of the, or the higher parts of the physical plane? Are they going into another dimension with these experiences? Yeah, we, we could. Now, see, that's depending on the ontology our view of the world, what exists, and epistemology is what we know, or what we claim, or how we can come to know. Um, but yes, the elementals, the devas, but it can also be dimensions like you're bringing up here. The El, El Nashi's E infinity theory is not just the 10 dimensions or 11 dimensions of string theory and of M theory, but is infinite. And so uh, an infinity of dimensions. Uh, so you can construe it that way, but definitely there's no question that what the uh, clairvoyance, um, Leadbeater, and others were seeing, um, and some of us see in these uh, subtle energies, etc. Yeah, they're, they're entering into those realms and seeing real things. I sat with... Uh, one individual, one of the shamans, was being given another substance, normally not taken by anybody, um, because it's very tricky. It has sometimes there's a dark side to these things too that you have to be very, very careful about. Um, uh, the brujos will use some of these substances, but there's one in particular. I'm not even going to talk about it because I don't want people thinking about what they might do. But uh, he w became came into the presence of all of these entities, uh, um, everything in nature, um, all of the plants have spirit spiritual presences, and there may be like a single mother spirit for each type of plant, which again is extremely interesting as you you look into the ontology of this. But yes, entering these other dimensions is probably uh, what's going on. Later, when we talk a little bit about my experiences, uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Okay, Scott, thank you very much for that. It was uh, very, very interesting indeed, um, you know, the function of these individuals and, you know, the way that they use so many of these substances. Um, as you just mentioned, you are at the moment working on uh, a piece of work about transformative experiences and specifically five which have happened to you personally in your own life. I believe this is for uh, a conference which is due to take place uh, at some point in the future. Would you like to talk a little bit about this and these transformative experiences? Because... You know, when we've had these talks before and people have mentioned these, which they do from time to time, there's always immense interest in them because I think people like to sometimes say, how does this stack up? How does this compare to what happened to me in that time at that place, you know? So over to you. Well, here again, it's interesting. Um, I've had, when I've asked, I've interviewed many, many of the experts. Uh, I remember when I interviewed, I probably have the last interview of Joy Mills um, uh, out at Cortona. And I asked her about her spiritual experiences. And like some of the others, they won't, she, she really did not want to, uh, of course, I was filming an interview with her, and she didn't want to describe them. Let's see. Somehow... We seem My to... screen has gone to Eddie Billamorius. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we are. Back again. Is Eddie having trouble getting in? Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, but, and I, in the past, I really haven't talked very much about them because, you know what, because the ego can get involved in these things. And, and the last thing I want is to be talking about these things in any braggadocious way. It is not intended whatsoever. But I, I decided with the IONS, I, International Association of Near-Death Studies, I've given several talks for them. I decided they, they have their uh, uh, conference this year uh, in August. 
late August and early September um, on transformation, uh, transformational experiences. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. So the first major experience for me was right after birth, probably the day after, uh, because it was when they brought me home from the hospital. And I was outside my body, not only outside my body, my father, a minister, they were bringing me from the car to the uh, parsonage next to the church. I was hovering above the church in total full consciousness. And this is also something else I'll mention when I talk about the third or the second experience. Um, I noticed you could see in all directions simultaneously. And uh, so as they're carrying me from the car to the house, I, and, and this, this may be an overlay that I subsequently put in, but I, I swear I recall, uh, oh no, here we go again. And later, when I was able to describe, you know, I could talk about these things and told my parents about it, shocked them. Because when I was born in 1949, my father bought a blue Pontiac, the only car I ever knew. I described the old black Ford that they drove me home in when I was born and um, described the baby basket, everything. Now, what's interesting in this one is when I got, when they got my body to the threshold of the door, there's something about crossing thresholds. I'm sure of this. I had a blackout, sinking blackout experience. And then the memories after that are looking up at, at my mother's face, you know, from a, a lying position. Um, but it helped give me a direction in my life that I never forgot. In fact, each of these experiences that I'll describe has helped hone. It's almost like here's the what, what Plato called the indefinite diet. Here's your greater and lesser of those golden ratios. Here's unity in the center, or it's the brow center. It's the ajna. It's the two petals, and it's the focal point. And what I've noticed is that as I go through these experiences, it's almost like the GPS um, recalculating. It's like we get off track. And then, okay, this one brings me back and it gels. And so my life has been a series of these experiences which have taken me closer and closer, golden ratio, all the way, which is where I'm at right now. Um, and um, I must say, I, I never had been more conscious in my life, even in my experiences in the rainforest, the epiphanies, etc. That's the biggie. Then when I was at the University of Minnesota, I had taken a class with Mulford Q. Sibley, political scientist, who had become interested in psi phenomena. So during my childhood, I had many, many experiences. There's a lot of little experiences and a realization there's so much more to all of this, but also a gravitation towards uh, Plato and the golden section all along and, and nature. Actually, when it, right after birth, the, early on in my life, four or five years old, uh, beauty, beauty was the big thing that attracted me, particularly this, the horses, the musculature and the beauty and the aesthetics of horses. Later, it became the human body, and I became a bodybuilder and did, did all this stuff and was third in the Teenage Mr. American, one Mr. Apollo. So that became a focal point for me. Um, but now I, uh, so this, the second experience was with Malford Q. Sibley. It was a class on psi phenomena. He lost his wife and was, uh, became very interested in uh, Bishop Pike and some of the other experiences and, and other teachers and, uh, and the paranormal phenomena and communication with the dead, actually. So I did a course or did my, Paper, my presentation, believe it or not, at the university uh, way back then was what, 1907, um, probably 1970, um, 69 or 70. Um, I worked very hard comparing transcendental meditation, um, um, 
I had a brainwave synchronizer, a strobe light. It could change you with the, the dial. You could change the, the rhythm of it with the brainwaves. Uh, mescaline, LSD, um, intense concentration, a crystal ball, candle flames, a moray pattern on the wall, huge. Probably the most important was the crystal ball, believe it or not. And the moray pattern looked like a, a uh, magnetic field because that would get focused in the center of there's a little bubble in the crystal ball, which really was glass, and everything in the room would be in there. And um, I began to notice that I could control the candle flames uh, with my brow center because I would sit on the end of my bed uh, and focus on this big poster, Moiré pattern, when I was trying to... Uh, but lift heavier and heavier weights. I go into self-hypnotic state, completely relax my body, and then I would use that focal point, uh, uh, and it, it was extremely powerful. Um, but then, uh, after doing all these things, I relaxed. I, I kind of <laughs> was exhausted. Went to my bed in my room on the seventh floor of the dormitory, and I had a pull over my eyes, and I realized I could see the stucco in the ceiling with my eyes closed. And I slowly lifted up out of the body, and I had these black light posters not only at the end, but also along the walls. It was almost like a bit of a tube, tunnel-like effect, somewhat similar to the near-death experiencers. And I was going right towards the uh, the center of that moiré field, <laughs> magnetic field. And I knew that I should be able to get through the wall. I done all this research. I was studying Alice Bailey, Blavatsky, I was doing all this research and work and uh, uh, et cetera. And um, then I said, wait a minute, you know, this is real. Let's, let's not go too far. You get outside there, are they going to find you seven stories down splattered on the cement? Are you going to be able to get back through the wall? Are, is somebody doing this to you? Are they going to take over your body? So unfortunately, I let a little bit of fear enter in. And so I struggled as I got to the wall, and I found myself, because you're, I was bodily, because I felt I, was, I ended up hanging on a big tripod um, drawing easel that I would draw on, as if I was hanging on my shoulder blade for a second, and then whap, back into the body, um, which became a very, very typical thing if, uh, while I was out of the body later on because I learned how to do this at will. Even though I didn't go all the way the first time, I knew the technique. For me, there was a ritual. Actually, using the towel was part of it. Putting my body to rest but keeping the mind alert, seeing the stucco in the ceiling lift out, and then I'd travel. And I realized you have to have a target when you would travel. But that was the, the beauty of that one was uh, it allowed me to basically do out-of-body experiences at will while I was a student at the University of Minnesota. I so brought I Baker ask, by... Sorry, go ahead. Can I ask you, Scott, did these things then kind of un unfold with progressive strength and force? Um, or did you learn something new when each of these experiences happened? Was there some sort of cumulative learning process going on here? Well, yeah, in a sense, yes, because by... Blocking when I got to the wall, I found I could not get through the wall. Well, I, was, I could get out of the body easily enough, but I couldn't get through the wall until one day. And what I would see, by the way, just so you know, it was very much the environment that was present there. Even though I'm out of the body, I could see things in there. It's slightly different, but it was the one day I found myself in the next room upside down. Uh, I floated through the wall and made it through, and I realized it's, it's so easy. And then one day, it's a 14-story dormitory. I'm on the seventh floor. And so this is the learning process. I went up through each of the floors and observed. probably shouldn't have done it, but I observed things going on that probably shouldn't be going on. And then I would tell the people about it later. So, yeah, it, that part. But not much more other than uh, I... I developed a, a, a psychokinetic ability, uh, particularly with candle flames, 
And one Easter, I was a bit naughty. My sister was sitting next to me in church, and uh, it was my father giving the sermon. It's Easter Sunday, and I'd been up all night, and so I was just totally open. And I told, I said, Nancy, you see the candles on the altar? <laughs> I said, look at the right one. And I made it go pip, 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 and I said, it's going to stop now. And I stopped, looked at the left one. So later, when I get to England and work with Hasted, um, he was doing psychokinetic studies. And so we, he set me up. We, we were doing tests with me with psychokinesis. So that's a, a little aspect of it. Um, later, I keep going, shift to the next one. Um, later, I met Douglas Baker not long after that. He came to Minneapolis. He did a ray reading, and we did my astrology chart. And I had been a very successful bodybuilder, um, Mr. Minneapolis, Mr. Twin Cities, all that stuff. So I was extremely powerful. Um, so I was very helpful. I could be helpful with loading books in the cars and traveling. <laughs> but he invited me immediately to come to England to study with him and, and uh, basically be his protege. Well, I ended up getting married. That didn't happen. Then later, when that didn't work out, in 1975, I ended up going to England. But while I traveled with Baker on a lecture tour around the U.S. in 1971, it was very intense, no sleep, very little sleep. Um, Detroit, Lansing, Chicago, all the way to New York, Boston, and some other small cities in between, but just incredible deal. Uh, when I was in Detroit, I had stayed up late. And I've got an example. It wasn't the one I used. It was actually pretty small. I was studying alchemy. Baker's, it was a pamphlet back then. It wasn't his book on alchemy. Um, but I was studying alchemy. I was using the caduceus. I'd already opened the brow center through these other experiences that I had. So I know how to focus very intently. Um, and I went to bed very, very late. Laid down, I remember, I can lay there all over the eyes, see the stucco. I didn't see the stucco in the ceiling. I saw the most powerful eyes. Now this I've never, so you folks are the first. This, this is coming out now. The most powerful eyes I've ever seen in my life. Not an extraterrestrial. This was a, a human face. But this is one, I, I suspect this is one of the traits of these arhats or these very powerful advanced beings is the power of their eyes. And I was lifted gently out of my body and ascended up and, and it was the most incredible experience. The colors were divine and it was very, very similar in the sense of this kind of uh, stuff going on. Uh, but I struggled there a little bit because of that early experience with the out-of-body experience. Uh, I fought it a little bit because I wasn't sure how far they were going to take me. So I didn't, didn't go as far as I could have. And so the, the next morning, um, Baker and I go to breakfast, and he asked me what happened. Uh, anything happened during the night? I think there was something astrological going on. And um, I said, yeah, and I described it to him. But I said, I also fought it a little bit. He said, well, you he was really pissed, actually, because he said, this may happen once in a lifetime. These are very unusual uh, possibilities. And he knew from the trait of the being that took me out of the body, which one of those adepts was that did it. So that was a major experience for me. Um, then uh, the next big one, the, the fourth, uh really big one was um, in the rainforest. And I was doing one of the ayahuasca sessions. It was the third of five sessions. And in that third session, and I can't say I was taken out of the body. I was out and I was in simultaneously. One of the things that happens when you do these, and we don't call them hallucinogens. That's kind of a misnomer. They're not creating hallucinations. They're actually drawing out everything you've got within you, everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's why set and setting, let me just say this right now, the mental set, your intention, if you're using a sacred substance and the setting, the environment, 
is all important. Um, so it's, it's not to be played around with. But um, so typically in a session like this, the plant spirit, the we sometimes we call it the circus. All of this incredible colors and stuff just are flowing through you. And it becomes a little bit unnerving, to say the least. Uh, but this time it was all of the plants and all of this stuff going through me and showing me how the golden ratio, golden section, Fibonacci numbers dominate. They are the key to nature, the key to the environment, period. No question. It was so profound. Now, I had been researching the book that I was going to be doing. I hadn't even started writing, but I was doing the research for Golden Section. But I was being taught literally all the things. I already knew so much of it, but here was the real McCoy. I was part of it, and I was perceiving it, and it was so profound that that night I realized I couldn't sleep. And instead, I was out of my, I was out of my body, but fully aware all the time. Never lost consciousness once. You're not going to believe this. For the next five days, totally awake, went home for the next two weeks, nineteen days straight, no sleep whatsoever. It was so overwhelming. And each day, I got a technique that I would. Um, I wasn't in bliss. 24 hours a day, but I would reconnect with what I would call the eternal now, which is so profound. But each day, reconnect, reconnect, for actually for 23 days, but twice after the 19th day, twice I lost consciousness for about 45 minutes to an hour. And I know, but uh, for 19 days without exception, I mean, and, and some people, they won't believe it, for 23 days, basically, I stayed. It was so overwhelming. Mm. Um, and I should tell you this. While I was still in the rainforest, while I was aware, and again, you're aware, you realize you're aware both in the body and while you're out of the body. So you can intensify your breathing while you're in the body to extend your abilities in astral projection. But they were teaching me how to alight, how to set down, because really it was very scary because I'd be so high in the air. It, you know, you, you'd think that you're going to crash to the ground, but eventually I could figure out how to do that. So there was a lot of training that went on with it as well. So that was, and so what happened when I got back, within six months, I had written Golden Section nature's greatest secret uh within one year this was october 2005 when the experience occurred october 2006 golden section was published it became the best-selling uh, wooden book there is and it's been published in nine languages etc cetera, etc cetera. but that is a product of that experience so just to wind things up should we move on to the what will be the the fifth of your um, revelatory experience, <laughs> transformative experiences. If you'd like to share that one, perhaps with okay. us. Now, this one, uh, again, nobody knows, but twice on two occasions when lecturing um, in Mexico City uh, for a conference on Otho Alvarius the toad medicine um and that's a very powerful medicine i must tell you extremely powerful five methoxy dimethyltryptamine is what it is not dmt i should sit, tell you in the ayahuasca you have two substances that go together there's the ayahuasca vine which is a uh, mao inhibitor it's the it takes care of the enzymes in the stomach uh, so that the DMT that comes from the chacruna leaves that you also are as part of the drink, the tea as we call it, uh, it allows it to be absorbed into the body. Otherwise, that particular substance has to be smoked. But 5-MeO DMT is quite different. Uh, 
personally, I don't like DMT by itself. myself. I don't uh, mess with that. But 5-MeO-DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, or Bufo alvarius, is the cat's pajamas. But what that leads to is not, you're not going for Atman to be one with Brahman. You're going for Anatta, more the Buddhist approach. Get rid of the ego, any sense of self whatsoever. If it's done correctly, and I'm not claiming it's been done, as I know when it's when it happens, it's going to be big. It's ego death. Twice while in Mexico City lecturing two different years for these conferences, I was uh, with a very small group. I was allowed to go to Teotihuacan, to the fertility temple at Teotihuacan, and do the Mufo Alvarius toad medicine. And I've had extremely profound experiences with it because with that, Unlike ayahuasca, is a five-hour ceremony. You do the the the, uh, the uh, toad medicine. It's like this. You're there. It's immediate. Can last for maybe twenty minutes, maybe a little bit longer. It's so profound that it can lead to ego death. So you have to be very, very careful. Not everybody's going to be ready for this. Uh, I, again, I'm not claiming that happened to me. I have, a, have had a taste of it. I know what it's like. Um, and again, I, I want people to, the, I hesitate in bringing these things out. And for you, Tim, I was willing to do it. Um, but I don't want people to get the wrong idea. These things are very powerful. But if I had not been a bodybuilder, if I had not strengthened my spinal column and had incredible stability, I would not have been able to go through the pain, particularly of the ayahuasca, particularly of that. But also with the bufo, the stability of the body is so important and the strength of it. I didn't realize it, that that's really what my bodybuilding was. It was, it was like the yoga asanas where my bodybuilding movements, etc., to be, and the pranayama, because I did very deep. And then I also, so I also had done um, Pratyahara, the sensory withdrawal, and I had done the Dharana, the intense focused concentration. Along those lines, I maybe could or should mention this if we're still okay time-wise, um, that um, after one of the experiences in the rainforest, I sat down in the middle of the uh, river that runs through the area that we have, um, and very rapid. It's, it's a place that we would relax, but it's all by myself. And a dragonfly, I realized something was looking at me. I looked up. I knew there was something. I look up and hear these two compound eyes staring at me. And it's a dragonfly. It was hovering above me. And it zooms down the, the river and circles around, comes back to me, circles around me, and then stares at me again, goes down, lights, and then lock, we lock eyes. And there definitely can be interspecies communication. And what I was being taught is dharana, because by focusing on the eyes of that dragonfly, I was able to go into the brow area and focus extremely intensely. And then during one of the ceremonies, ayahuasca ceremonies, I was able to share with the others the experience. And uh, one of the other uh, gentlemen, he tried it, uh, locking eyes uh, with the dragonfly, and they had a very similar experience. Anyway, I just thought I'd better throw that in. But I'm really, uh, I don't want people thinking that uh, these are recreational things to be played with. They are not at all. They are used for uh, uh, overcoming cocaine addiction, alcoholism. They're now being used throughout the United States, out in California. Some of my friends are out there. I actually write about them in, in that Mysteries of the Amazon book. Charlie Grove is the head of the, the uh, uh, department out at uh, Harbor Medical Center out at UCLA, and they're doing all this research with it, but it is for helping people, not recreational at all, not in, 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 it's not hallucinatory. It brings everything up, 
but you have deep insights into the real nature of what's going on. Thank you, Scott, so much for everything. And also at the end there for putting everything into its rightful context and everything. We've covered uh, a massive uh, amount of stuff over the last hour and a quarter. So um, there we are. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Could I say thank you to everyone for attending? Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.